So have you ever looked at machine learning source code for TensorFlow, Keras in this case, and thought, wow, there's a lot going on there. That's complicated. What I'm going to show you in this video, I'm trying something a bit new. So let me know with a like or in the comments if you like this format or if you don't. I'm going to look at complicated machine learning code well beyond just the simple classification, I don't know, iris data set or even simple computer vision. We're going to look through code that was implemented for a paper. In this case, we're going to look at style transfer. But what this shows you how to do is a custom optimizer using the gradient tape. So how you can pretty much just optimize anything that you can throw a TensorFlow function at and how you can use transfer learning to, in this case, to bring embeddings in from the VGG trained neural network. We're going to look at data that's not in RGB format. We're going to see also how we process and create a multi-objective loss function that is coming from three different sources. So the term complicated source code, that's completely relative. That's, that's like when people say, oh, that's high school math. I, it's, it's completely relative to your, to your skill level. Something that might seem simple for me might be complicated for you. Something that might seem simple for you could be complicated for me. I'm not just going to point to the lines one by one. I'm going to show you how I take a piece of source code that I don't completely understand and pick it apart line it up to the paper, line it up to documentation in Keras, and make our way through it. We're going to be looking at code that I did not create. We're going to look at an example that was implemented according to the original paper from Francois Chalet, who is the creator, the original sort of creator, of Keras. So this is, I really like looking at code by very advanced individuals because this, this improves me. It's like reading fine literature, although I don't do that that often. I uh, did read some Shakespeare in high school, but basically it, it lets you really see how things should be implemented. So the code that we're going to take a look at is the neural style transfer. This was created by Francois Chalier. It's about four years old at this point, and it was last modified in 2020, so this is good. They've been keeping it up. We're going to look at it actually in CoLab, but just if you're not familiar with what this code does, it essentially takes a regular photograph like you see here of Paris. It then takes some sort of a painting and then applies through a bunch of code. Not a bunch of code, it's relatively small the style to it, and you're left with this. I want to demonstrate the code that was created to do this because it shows some advanced techniques that can be very useful in TensorFlow style game. When I look at code like this, first of all, I want to get the, the paper open because we will refer to the paper a couple of times as we, as we go through this. The paper is really pretty readable and approachable. We'll talk about a couple of couple of techniques that it pulls into here. So I often hear about using these frameworks for quote unquote research. I would say this falls under that category. If you're taking something that's a bit non-standard, that is not just a typical classification or image recognition problem, and you're trying to actually apply it. So we'll refer back to this. The paper is not that long, and it's not really what I would say that mathematically dense. So there's the paper. Let me leave that open. Just surveying this, you see some of the things going on. In the very first part, they're loading the images. That's not terribly complicated, displaying them. There's some pre-processing steps and deprocessing steps going on here. If you've not looked at VGG, which is the neural network that we're going to use for some style transfer, and in, layer embedding, then this might seem a little bit complicated in terms of what is going on here. We'll, we'll get into that as we, as we go through that. Why are those numbers being added to the color components? 
why are we clipping to this range? What, what's with this weird colon colon negative one? That's all VGG related stuff. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Then here's where a lot of, it, it gets pretty complicated. You've got the, the gram matrix. So we need to deal with why we're doing a gram transformation on the matrix. It's dealing with introducing some correlations between the various layers of the VGG network that we're using. And we'll get into why we're doing that. And then what really gets interesting with this particular neural network is we are using three different components to the loss function. And to make those three custom loss functions actually be used, we have to give Keras a way to form gradients on those so that we can apply an optimization function. And here's where we actually use VGG. This is actually the only neural network that's used in, in this. So this is, this is using neural network almost just for pre-processing. The actual work that the model is doing is not it's sort of a neural network. We'll get to that in a moment. This is the complete loss function, so we'll, we'll deal with that. We make it a compiled TensorFlow function for optimization. And this is the real training loop that's going on here. Just to talk about this at a high level, we're going through 4,000 iterations. And when I am trying to understand source code like this, I need to know the overall structure of what's going on. Because one of the things when I first saw style transfer like this, I thought, oh, I'm going to just apply this to a video and do every single frame and, and create kind of a cool effect as the intro. No, that, that actually doesn't work. And I want to explain why that doesn't work, because that becomes an important characteristic of this is you have to think about what you're really doing. So you're using an optimizer, and the optimizer is stochastic gradient descent, but we're not just going to call Akira's fit function in this case. We're going to literally, and this looks almost PyTorch-like, we're going to go through all of the iterations by hand. We're going to call compute loss and gradients, which comes from Kira's. So this is going to use this optimizer to, well, the optimizer is going to actually apply the gradients. We're going to compute the gradients with this compute loss and, and grad function. So this is, this is really getting a little more lower level where we're not just calling fit, running through a bunch of iterations. We're in control of every iteration. We're computing our loss and our gradients, and we're also applying the gradients using the optimizer. Now, if, you, if you're a little unfamiliar with this, the gradients, that's, that's essentially the instantaneous rate of change. It's a calculus concept. You can think of the gradients at a very high level. I'm skipping all the math on this one for a moment as sort of hints as far as which way each individual weight needs to go in order to minimize the loss function. So you're creating these three loss functions, each of which returns sort of a number the optimizer's trying to crunch that number as close to zero as it possibly can. And the, the gradients are hints as far as how to do that on each weight. Now, when I say weight, that's an important characteristic here too, because we have the loss, we have the gradients, we are going to use the optimizer and we're going to apply it to the, to the gradients. The weight is actually what's this, this com combination image that's created up here. So if you see what we're doing, take a step back. We're getting the base image. That's Paris. We're getting the style reference image. That is the, the starry night looking thing, the painting. And then we're getting the combination image. The combination image, if you notice, it's exactly the same thing, almost. It's, it comes from the base image. So at the beginning, the base image and the combination image are really the same thing. The combination image is the weights. So that's what's going to be modified. That's the parameters that the objective function is going to give the optimizer, the stochastic gradient descent, the way to, to, to crunch this down. 
So when I first was learning this algorithm, I was looking at this completely the wrong way. I thought we were training a neural network to emulate the style that we have up here. I thought we were training a neural network that would take in this, apply the style that we had taught it to do, and then give us out the final version here. And if that's what we were to do, applying this to video would be relatively easy. You would simply take that neural network that you had just trained and put every video frame into it, FFmpeg, the whole thing together. That's how you combine individual frames into an MP4 file. But it's not that easy because what we're really doing here, we're not training anything really. We're simply taking the combination image, which is Paris, and each of these iterations that we're going through, we're modifying the weights, but the weights are Paris. It's, it's that actual image. So we're gradually stepping through and modifying the weights slowly so that each of those three objectives that we have, which we're going to get to in a moment, are satisfied as much as possible. So we're trying to push all three of those together. And those three are doing things like making sure it still looks something like the original, applying the style, and then making sure that the pixels close together are not too much of a, a divergent. And we'll get to why all three of those are important. But we're not training any neural network. We've got a neural network, VGG, that is giving us some features that are being used to calculate those loss functions. So if I wanted to truly apply this to, to video, I would essentially have to retrain the neural network each time. And I could do that, but it's going to take a lot of time. On a higher-end GPU, And it wouldn't be horrible. I could certainly do it, probably let it run overnight or a day. But the problem you'll have is you've got, there's really, I mean, there is the stochastic nature from the stochastic gradient descent, I believe. You'd have to think about if there's any stochastic initialization going on in here. And I didn't check into that because then you could get kind of a weird flicker going on with the image where each each frame sort of has a different um, a different look. I don't know if you've seen some of the animation like MTV's Liquid TV, where they had the really kind of squiggly lines around animation. That's that's sort of what what you would end up looking like, and not intentionally. So let's take this apart and try to really understand what is actually going on here. To do this, I am going to go ahead and open this up in Colab. And this is, this is the process that I go through when I'm trying to really understand code that I don't understand and learn the actual technique that's happening or when I'm intensely debugging my own code. So here it is, we're going to go to runtime, we're gonna change the runtime type to, don't need high RAM, but I do need a GPU. I'm using Google Colab Pro, so I'll have either a P100 or a V100. So Google Pro, Colab Pro is great. I'm gonna do an updated 2021 video of that. It's it's completely worth it. I have, a, I have an A6000 and I still use Google Pro, Colab Pro, just to, just to kind of prototype things. There's, there's definite disadvantages, but it's, not, it's, it's a great deal for 10 USD a month. So let's start to run some of the code. We're gonna just take this completely through. Normally, I would run the entire thing completely through, just verify that it works and that I get the expected output. But I'm gonna start running it through and try to really understand it, looking at the code and seeing what it's doing. So here, we're loading Paris, we're loading Starry Night, we're using Kira's get file. That's basically just a download. The result prefix is just going to be, we're going to save the frames of each of the images at the end because we're going to see how it, it gradually gets more and more concrete as far as what we want it to display. And again, what we're saving, we're saving the images. We're not saving a neural network because we're not training any neural network here. We're not saving the, the weights because the weights is actually the image. So we're, we're saving those. But at the end, you've got nothing. You've got 
basically the image converted into Paris, but you don't have anything that could be used on any other image. You've got that image, that's all you have. If you want to apply this to video, there's other subsequent papers that have done some very interesting things. We'll play around with these a bit. These are the weights. So there, remember, there's three parts of the objective function. This is how important each of it is. And these don't sum to zero or anything. You can see they're very small numbers. So they're one out to the sixth decimal place, one out to the sixth decimal place. Those are actually equal. And then the content weighting is, is even smaller. So if you think of what these are doing, the style weight is how well are we implementing that abstract painting style? The content weight is, does it still look like what we what we wanted it to? If, if you just focused on style, the neural network would be like, fine, I'll just copy it, done. But you need to have multiples going on. The variation weight, I'll show you some results with and without this one. I wasn't Im impressed with this one helping or, or not. I'll show you exactly what it what it does. And by the way, let's let's go ahead and take a look at that up front. So the first thing I did with this is I ran it completely through and I set each of these to zero, one by one. So I do that a lot. If, if you've got a multiple objective function and you want to understand really why it needs three different objectives, set one to zero, run it and see what your end results are. And I have those here. So the first thing that I did is I just ran the whole thing through just to establish a baseline. This is getting the same result as what the, the original code did. So let's keep that up there as a reference. When I'm editing the video, I'll probably put them in bigger so you can see it easier. But the first thing I did was I totally turned off the variation. So this first one, I set that to zero. And let's see what that looks like. This is the one that I was less, I don't know, I, I, I guess I can kind of see why it's useful, but if you look at these images very, very closely side by side, look at the detailing on the windows. It's, it's much more abstract in the, so let's look at the style weight, the second one. This one, you see a drastic difference. So if we turn off the style, then kind of what is this thing even doing? It's not even, it, it's, it's no longer saying that it has to be using that same style. So it looks like a blurry photograph, essentially. The sort of, the, the first objective that we looked at here that was introducing the blur, it's still there, but it's, it's, it's all that's happening. So you, you have no uh, style being given to it at all. And then the the final one, the one that is basically asking that the content be there. This one also it, it didn't it did not change it a whole lot. I can barely detect actually the differences here. I think the reason we're not seeing as much of a change because you'd think, okay, I turned off the content objective. It's just, it's just going to be, uh, it, it's, it's just going to copy the painting across. But I believe information about the painting is seeping through as a result of the, the total variation one that we see here, which is basically looking at introducing the blur. So I think you've got some information slipping slipping in here. But I, I do like turning these on and off because you can, you can see that really certain parts of the paper are much, much more important than others. And what, what I'm looking at doing with this is I may want to introduce some of my own so that I can add objectives related to very specific styles that I may want it to learn to emulate. Just, just some ideas there. So we ran that. We run this part. This just displays the images. Not, not too much excitement there. Let me go ahead and run these two. So this is your pre-process and deprocess image. 
Essentially, what this is going to do is pre-process the image so that it can be read by the VGG neural network. In VGG neural network, it's a network that was trained on 1,000 images from ImageNet. And what it is mainly contributing to this is we're feeding the we're feeding the, the images that we're working with into it to extract features from them from those convolution layers that are inside of it. And we're, we're using those to help it detect the style because embedded in VGG is going to be things about corners, edges, um, eyes, and all sorts of different things that it extracted to know how to process those images and classify them. So this is... I guess this is somewhere between transfer learning and sort of embeddings. This is almost like using VGG as sort of a word to vec if you've worked with the, the, the natural language processing. Because in natural language processes, you can take individual words and you can pass the letters of them into the neural network, but that doesn't tell the neural network all that much because it doesn't know the meanings of them, just like the images. It doesn't know the meanings of, of what it's seeing in there, but if you put something like VGG in there, you're, you're going to communicate some, some meaning there. Process image, this is, there's not a lot going on here. It's just getting into the form that we can send it into this pre-process image that is provided by VGG. All of the Kira's transfer learning models that they give you have a process input, and that basically takes the image and puts it into the form that the neural network that you're transferring in needs to have. VGG has some very specific input formats, and that's all handled for you in process image. However, when you want to take something back out of it and make it look like a real image again, you have to convert it out of VGG19 form, and, and that's what all this code is doing. And this code might look a bit complex. I mean, when I first look at it, why these numbers? The first thing that I always do to figure out something like this is I will take those numbers and scan the paper. Okay, is it a paper thing? No, they're not in the paper anyway. The first thing that was just kind of popping into, yeah, I'm going to use the GPU in a minute. Patience, Google. So basically, these numbers are right about in the middle of the, the 255 range that 24-bit color is is used in. So my initial guess when I first saw this is it's it's doing something, some sort of a shift to move those inputs so that they're centered around um, zero for the input to the neural network because that, that tends to help neural networks. So it's moving it out of that 255 range and making it more centered around zero, which is always a good thing for neural ne networks. But nonetheless, just to show you how I research some of this, the Google I would do right here on this is 103, 116, 123, just that alone, nothing. Um, I'm wondering if it has something to do with VGG. And now look at this, how to normalize data for the VGG 16 pre-trained process. And you see there are those, those numbers. And now you can start to figure out what the heck was going on there. Those numbers come from the original VGG paper. I dug deeper back when I first used VGG. And that's exactly what it's doing. It's centering. Those are essentially from the data, from the images that VGG was trained on, where are essentially the probably the medians, maybe the maybe the means of all of those RGB values. So what this is doing is saying for all of the rows and columns, that's those first two colons, for the first one, for the for the B actually, because these are not in RGB format. Normally that would be red, but for the blue for the green and for the red, add that amount. So that is now taking those numbers that are spanning between zero and spanning right across zero, probably 120, negative 127 to positive 127, more or less. But it's going to then move them into, into more of a zero to 255 range like we're going to deal with. 
This image is also stored not in RGB, but in BGR. So why BGR? Uh, you, you can definitely Google and research that a bit, but essentially a lot of cameras internally do store it as BGR, and OpenCV uses BGR. And I believe VGG was used a lot with OpenCV, so they, they essentially just, just copied it. So you just have to flip the R, and you, you essentially have to flip it uh, backwards. I mean, the human race will store exactly the same thing in a bunch of really different ways. Just look at all the adapters you need for your laptop if you're a world traveler. This means all the rows, all the columns, but you might not have seen two colons. Colon, colon, like that basically just means start, colon, end. You're probably used to that. It, if you don't put a start or an end, it's going to go from the start to the end, and that's what we're doing in all three of these. But there is actually a third parameter that you might not have noticed, which is step. And you can put a negative on it to make it go backwards, negative one. So what this is really doing is just flipping the RGB order. So that's some numpy. You, you might have seen that a thousand times or you might not have seen that before. So these two functions are quite useful at the beginning and the end to move the image in and out. Now we need to compute the style loss. We're using something called a gram matrix. Yes, gram matrix. So it's essentially, it's for an in, inner product space, uh, but we're actually using it for an outer product space. So I'll show you what that means in a moment. An inner product space, in mathematics, inner product space is, ooh, a Hilbert space. Hilbert space, that has ruined the career of braver YouTubers than, than me, but Nonetheless, it's Hilbert spaces, we don't need to get into that fortunately for, for this one, but basically what we're doing here is this transformation where we're taking the transpose, not the inverse, but the transpose of a matrix and multiplying it by itself. We'll, we'll see why to do that. I'll actually take that function apart. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. So here we are basically getting the, the we're getting the gram matrix. That part is really just the gram. This is just setting it up for the gram. And all the gram is, is we're taking the features, we're taking some sort of a, a matrix, we're transposing it, and then we're multiplying it by itself. That basically just sets up a bunch that kind of cross-pollinates the, the features so that they're all related and now correlated to, to each other. We'll, we'll see that in a moment. And then the style loss, we take these two grams, we deal with the number of channels, this is just so we can average, and then the size of the image. By the way, image size, I'll show you this up here too. Image size, basically the author decided to just limit it to 400, which is, which is fine. A uh, little bit low res. You can actually make these anything that you want to because really the images are just going into VGG, and VGG has its own set input size, but you're, you're going to have to, you're just going to get maybe fewer details going into there to get those features. It, it really doesn't, it really doesn't matter. This is just a convenience. Now, if your images are much higher resolution than what VGG deals with, and VGG is pretty low res, that's what that preprocess function is going to actually handle for you. This is going to basically just scale it down to whatever VGG actually needed. This one here, actually. Okay, so let's go ahead and define all of these. I'm going to let them run because I'm not ready to rip them apart yet but we are going to rip all three of these apart and see what they do. We'll go ahead and load VGG. It's, it's coming in here. We are creating a outputs dictionary. This is kind of interesting. So when I want to know what's happening with something like this, well, if you're not familiar with it, models.layers, I mean, that's basically all of the, the layers in that model. So there's all your convolution layers. What it is doing is going through each of those layers and taking the layer name and the layer output. It is basically building a map 
a lookup to go from the human readable name to the actual dictionary. So block one convolution is this Keras tensor. And that's all that's happening there. We'll need that in a moment just so that we can look them up. We then create the feature extractor. And this is using a Keras model. The input is going to be the model inputs basically from VGG. So if we do model.inputs, it shows you here basically is, is the input. This is really not telling you too much. It's just telling you three is RGB. That's the batch size. And then the rows and columns is essentially what is going into there. The output from this is going to be a dictionary. So the output is going to be not just the output layer like you normally had, but it's going to be all those layers keyed by the layer names. So this is, this is a useful technique that you'll see sometimes when you really want to have the outputs from every layer of the neural network, which is what we're doing. They're using multiple layers because that gave them better renditions of the, of the style. Because the layers closest to the input layer are going to be very concrete in terms of the image. The ones further out are going to be very abstract in terms of building up features from, from previous layers. This comes right from the paper. These are the layers that we are going to use, the outputs from those, to detect the style. Now, there's been other papers that have done style detection. So it could even look at something and say, oh, that's Renaissance, that's Picasso era abstract. Um, I'm not an art guy. So it looks, it, it could use those. This paper extended on that and tried to use it to actually replicate the style. And then the layer to do content loss, so detecting if it's still the image. We're not just doing a pixel-to-pixel -pixel comparison. We're looking at the actual features coming out of it. So in, in older computer vision, if you're trying to make something, I don't know, look like a mosaic, you'd do a pixel-to-pixel -pixel comparison of your output and the input. That's the old school way to do it. The newer way is you, have, you extract those features from the convolution and you compare feature to feature. And that gives you that gives you a positional invariant way. So if if it's seen something at the top or the bottom due to the scanning nature of the filters of the convolution neural network, that will that's why they're doing that. And then this is the the, the big hairy compute loss. It's actually not that bad. These are the three that initializes it, and then these are the three parts of it. We'll we'll jump into that code in a moment. I want to get it all running because I want to get the output. This just brings it all together. It uses gradient tape. That is so that we can actually get those derivatives of it. You can take the derivative of the whole thing and get the, the individual weights component gradient. We'll run that. And this is the training loop. Let's go ahead and kick this off just so that it starts crunching through. I'm going to break it because I don't want it to actually go through. We're using the optimizer, so the initial learning rate is 100, which is which is big, and the decay step. So over 100, we're going to decay it by a rate of 0.96. So that's pretty common. You take the learning rate down as you go. The learning rate is like a magnifying glass. You've got those gradients. If you wanted to go completely crazy, you would multiply the gradients by something like you're doing here and just sum them right into the weights, but that might be too extreme or it might be too slow. So you can change the learning rate to determine how, how much of the gradient is actually going into the weight. This is trial and error, typically. You, you usually want to decay it so that it, as it learns more and more, it becomes less intense of an update. We talked about these three before. We're loading the base image, the style image, and then this is the weights. This is what we're actually training. We're literally starting with the photographic image and training it as we go through. We go through all the iterations. We get the loss and the gradients. We apply, this is where the image actually changes. We apply the gradients to it. You could definitely play around with these and see how it actually adjusts those. If, if, 
if you wanted smaller steps or, or bigger steps, smaller steps will sometimes give you better, better results, but it takes longer. And then every 100 iterations, we're going to print something out. So you can see if you're used to normal higher level Keras, there's no model fit in here. This, this looks a lot, I mean, to me, this looks a lot more like PyTorch. And when people complain, Keras is horrible for research because you can't control the lower level details. Yes, that's true, but this is how you're kind of doing the same thing with it. And this used to be a pain in the rear in TensorFlow 1.0, especially before you had the pre-calculation uh, steps on the graph. But you, you can really do a lot of this stuff. I, I do feel like Keras has closed, and TensorFlow has closed a lot of those complaints. But nonetheless, it was it was bad enough that they have lost a lot of mind share of research papers. So I I tend to I tend to work with both of them. And here you can see it's training as training. I'm going to go ahead and stop this because I want to look at how these loss functions are actually happening. So the way I tend to pick this kind of stuff apart is I run the code and watch it at each step. So we've got the compute loss here, and I'm going to take literally these two functions, these two lines of code, I should say, multiple lines, and I am going to take them down after the training loop and I'm going to run them just so I can start to pick that apart and see what it's actually doing. So we are going to create an input tensor. I think everything's named the same. Okay, good, so that worked. So let's see what that input tensor actually looks like. What are we really doing here? Because if you notice, the input tensor, is this is essentially a batch because you're going to be passing three things into the model. You're passing the base image, the style, reference image, and the, the combination image. So if we look at that, you can see, let's do a dot shape. You can see it's essentially a batch size of three and a 400 by 599. And then you've got your RGB, obviously. If you let it just stream out, you can see that weird VGG format where it's trying to span from sort of negative 127 to positive 127 or so. There's a 128 either on the front or the tail, but that is, that's what it's doing. Then it's passing that into features, to the feature extractor. Now remember the feature extractor is going to take in a VGG style input tensor and it's going to return a map, basically, or a dictionary of all of those various layers. So if we do that, we're going to get an explosion of stuff. Let's do dot keys. So there are essentially all, that's, that's the output. So these are all of these individual layers. If we wanted to see just one of them, because we're going to deal with them one by one as we get into it. So this is one of the layers in there. So this is basically giving us a three, that's your batch size again. So those are your three, that's the base image, the style reference. So we just send all three of them in one batch. That's more efficient than calling it three times. This is essentially the scan size. So that's that square that's going across as you're doing the convolution. And 64, that is the number of filters that you have on the convolution layer. What do these all mean? This is essentially information that gives you clues as to the features that were detected in the image by VGG. So that is the first part of it. We're getting, let's go back up to where that was that I took that from. We're going to initialize the loss to zero, but let's deal first with the content loss. So what this is doing is we're taking the layer features so we're, we're getting the features from, remember, we had that content layer name. And then we are going to get that also for the base image features and the combination features. So remember that batch size, 0, 1, 2. That is where we're basically, the 0 means the base image 
and the two means the combination image. So that's where that's coming from, and it's grabbing the whole thing from those colons. And then we're going to do loss equals loss plus content image, and then we're calling a function here called the content loss that is going to basically get calculate the actual content loss for all of these 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 two features that we're passing in the the original image and then where we're currently at in our training this is essentially a root mean square you're you're squaring the combination and the base so you're taking the base image minus the combination image now that could be positive that could be negative so you've got to do either an absolute or a square as far as that the re the reason we're doing a square over an absolute is the the derivative is easier the absolute value the derivative is undefined i think it's zero so that that causes uh, that causes some issues there you can google absolute value versus square in loss functions and there's all kinds of information on that so this is this is a pretty this is a pretty simple one in terms of what we're doing there and by the way the reduce this comes back to just a single a single number so the loss is being added to it remember the content weight that we had that's how important it is of those three numbers the ones that i set to zero to see to, to drop out these various objectives so that's that's basically just taking a root mean square difference a Euclidean distance between the features of the original image and where we're currently at. And the, the fascinating thing here is we're not comparing the individual pixels of each, we're comparing the VGG features extracted from them. And that gives it so much more intelligence about what's going on actually in the image. Let's skip style loss for a moment because it is the most complicated of the ones that we're looking at. And by the way, if I wanted to, back to content loss for a moment, if I wanted to continue to pick this apart and understand really what's going on, what I would do is continue with what I was doing here. So we would get the layer features just, just like that. You'd run it, you'd see your layer features, which is that big, we saw that before. And this is what that particular one is outputting. It's 25 by 37. So this is a higher level set of features. It's not as high res as before. So these are like higher, higher level features, like maybe eyes and hair and other things that it's, it's detecting. Put the next bit of the code in there. We get the base image feature and the combination features. So we can take that off. If we run this, you get both of those. If you run this dot shape, you'll see it's just extracted it. That batch isn't on there anymore because we, we've pulled it out. And now to actually get the loss, I'm not going to sum the loss because I don't have it defined, but you can see basically it calling that and that is that so that loss is not a matrix or anything it is essentially a number and that is that component of it that you would then multiply by the content weight and continue to uh, continue to build that up if you didn't want to add it to the existing loss that's just what the individual component is so it's 46 so let's keep ripping that part of and that's, that's how I really debug into these things. I just run the code little by little by little and watch the whole thing happen. Now the style loss is a bit more complicated. The style loss comes from across several layers. We're getting the features, but this is very similar. We're getting the layer features just like we did up here. And we're getting the style. So this is, this is important to note when we were doing content loss, we were comparing the base to where we're per currently at. We were not considering the style. It was zero and two. Now it's one and two. So we're considering style to where we're at. You wouldn't compare the style to the original because 
that's just your starting point. So we're going to call style loss with the style features and the combination features. And then we're just going to multi we're going to use the style weight. You have now why are we doing this slightly more complicated math here rather than just adding it like we did here? Basically, because we have several layers, and this is essentially averaging them so that each one takes an equal part of, of the whole as we put it back together. But let's look at how we break the style apart, because I find this really, really quite interesting. So we're going to call the Gram matrix on the style and the combination. The Gram matrix, let's rip this apart and really understand what's happening here because there, there's a fair amount happening. Go back down to where I was at. Let's, let's just put it in here. We're done with that part. So we need an X because we're gonna transpose it. And to get that, that X is going to be basically the, the, the features for one of these. So let's, let's grab the code from what was calling it. So the style loss, basically we just need the features for, for one of these layers. It, it, almost do, it almost doesn't matter which one we're using, just for explanation purposes. We care mainly about the shapes. So let's go back down to here. Let's just grab the, the combination features that we just had here. So we're gonna say X equals the combination features, and I think this is gonna work. Yeah. So let's look at what X is, because X was transposed. X.shape. Let's do a before and after. Before and after. Look, it's just it's just flipping it around, basically. So what this is is 25 by 37. That's the dimension of this particular feature and then our layer. And then that's how many filters we have. We want to get filters to the beginning because all of those filters, those are just different ways of looking. Those are just individual components. So each filter is learning different things, scanning across by a 25 by 37 box. So we want to get this to the beginning, as you can see there. And then we're going to reshape it. And that's what this 201 means. That's the dimensions. So the, the first, what would have been the first one goes to there because zero is the first two. It, it's, it's just a set of indexes, basically. We're going to put features there. And then let's continue to print this out. Got to run this first. And then we print out the feature shape. So this is reshaping it. Notice that 512 is still there, but this got much bigger. That's that 25 times 37. So you're, you're taking the matrix and flattening it into a, into a vector. So now we've got a nice matrix, this 512 by 925. And to take the gram of this, what we're going to do is we're going to do this whole thing. Let me just put gram in there for now, and then we'll run it, and we'll see what the gram looks like, but then we'll break that apart. It's gonna be a nice square matrix. So 512 by 512. So this is basically those 512, this is almost like a dimension reduction a little bit, not exactly, it's more like a correlation matrix, but it is, it's essentially cross-pollinating all of those, all of those features because we want to look at them together. We don't want to look at them univariately, all separately. We want them combined because together all of those features represent the style of the, of the image. So that's 512 by 512. And all we're doing to create the gram is features that shape. If we print that out, I mean, that's the 512 by 924. And if you transpose it, that shape, 
Then you'll see it there. So you're, you're just taking the transpose of that, and then you're going to multiply it. So matrix multiplication, you can do a whole video on that. There's tons of them out there. But essentially the result, these two have got to be the same, the 925s. So whenever I'm looking at matrix multiplication, basically these two need to be the same, and then your resulting matrix is going to be that by that. That's the quick way that I just sort of think of matrix multiplication. And you're multiplying the matrix by its transpose, which is essentially what the Graham matrix is. So now you've got these two matrices that are all nice and cross-correlated. And <coughs> you can now basically calculate the loss, which was here. So you're calculating the Gram matrix for the style, the Gram matrix for where we're currently at. And then you're just going to essentially take the difference of them. You're going to take the difference, square it, and sum it. You see this over and over and over in machine learning. It's basically root mean square error. It's the, it's the Euclidean distance. So you're, you're, you're going down one by one by one, looking at each difference, subtracting them. Well, that could be positive or negative. You don't want to penalize for one or the other, so you square it. Now that's a positive number. Think of it like an absolute value. And then the sum, you're just adding them all up. So it's like taking an average at that point, and then you just need to divide it by the number of numbers that you would have in there. And that's what this, that's what this is basically doing. The channels, the size, uh, and, and this gets it more, this normalizes it is what this is doing. That's essentially the size of, of the whole thing. So that's, that's how your style loss is happening. And that gives it a good indication of the style. There's a lot of prior research as to why that, that does it. But basically, you're looking at the style of the... You're looking at the features from the VGG of both, of both the style image and where you're currently at. And then if you look at this last one, this is where we're doing the variation loss. This is what makes it more fuzzy. If you look at it, we're basically taking a difference. And again, we're, we're doing, we're, we're squaring it. Well, we're not squaring it here. It's, it's not a pure square radical. It's, it's a 1.25. So they're apparently reducing the intensity. The paper probably discusses that would be my guess. Or that might be a math. I'm not familiar with that as a general machine learning construct. If anybody does on that one, let me know in the comments. But essentially, it's it's reducing the intensity of this the squaring. So it's, it's almost putting a weight on it, I would think. But we're, we're raising it to a power that gets rid of the negative, and then we're reducing the sum. And all we're doing here is taking the, the image, and we're, and this is comparing itself. This is where we're currently at. We're taking a slight offset. So this one starts at the beginning to just at the edge, and then this one shifts it down a little bit. So this, this looks at neighboring pixels and sees how similar they are. And reducing this causes it to get less resolution and, and more fuzzy. So those are your three loss components. And essentially, we're just modifying the images of the pixel of the image further and further and further until you get left with something like that. And that's basically how this works. So that was a pretty low level description of how I rip code apart and truly understand what's going. I feel like I understand really every every inch of this code at this point. And I want to do some related of my own kind of not style transfer, but modifications to images that I'll probably do more videos on in the, in the future, if that seems interesting. But let me know in the comments, was this too low level? Did you, was this useful? Really, truly seeing how you can, you can break apart the code and really understand what's actually going with TensorFlow and Keras. Would you like to see the same thing in PyTorch? Uh, that's basically, but that's, that's basically it.